come in. Uh, sorry, professor. professor Josh Blackman from Texas Law. He graduated from George Mason. Uh, he teaches common law and property and he's doing a federalism seminar as well. And he also he has his own website. I'm sure you guys check it out. He has a Fanny Scotus blog, so it's pretty interesting for anybody that's so inclined. Um, anyway, uh, you know, help me give him a warm welcome. <laughs> All right, how's everyone doing today? Good? All right, well, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak with you today. So today you're in for a treat. You get not only one constitutional right, but you get two constitutional rights. And what we're discussing today is the Second Amendment, the First Amendment, and 3D printed guns. Hold on. Can you hear me okay? Do I need the mic? Okay. I never like these mics. I always get this weird echo. So we have a bonus for today. We're having two discussions of two constitutional rights. And our focus is on how the Second Amendment and the First Amendment protect 3D printed guns. Okay, so to begin, who has ever used a 3D printer? Anyone? What have you printed? Very cool. What did you print? You didn't print a gun, did you? You are not Texans. So, <laughs> 3D printing is a way of taking objects designed in a computer in three dimensions, like a house or a car, and turning them into an actual object, okay? And 3D printing works in a very simple manner. The same way I would use words to describe an object. For example, if I want to build a ball or a cylinder, I will tell you, if you remember geometry, what the radius is and what the height is. If I tell you there's a cylinder with a height of 20, right, height of 20 and a radius of five, you can know roughly what is the dimensions of that shape. We are using natural language to describe objects on a computer that when printed out become real. So these are some objects that were created by a 3D printer. These are fairly basic ones, little cheap plastic tchotchkes, right? But you can actually make sophisticated objects in three dimensions, every shape and size. So what kind of 3D printers did you guys use? No, you're not very helpful. So this is one 3D printer and you can see you can make some pretty cool stuff. So let's discuss how 3D printing works. So does everyone know how to make a candle, right? You take a string, you dip it in wax, you pull it out, right? You dip it in wax, you pull it out, you dip it over and over again, and each time you dip into the wax, it gets thicker and thicker on the base until you have an actual candle. 3D printing works in a very similar fashion, but instead of dipping a, a thread into wax, you have this little nozzle that sprays a very thin layer of plastic, We're talking about a couple millimeters. And it sprays one layer of plastic, sprays another layer of plastic, and another layer of plastic, one on top of the other on top of the other, until you have a full object such as this ball. And this is another shot which discusses how it works. You shoot this plastic down on this heated bed, so the second the plastic touches it, it cools. Okay? This is how you create objects. This is not a new technology, but it's only recently become affordable. So I want to show you a demonstration of how 3D printers work. And it's creating an object that almost everyone in the room should know what it is. Okay? And when you see what the object's being created is, I want you to raise your hand and call it out, okay? Got it? Okay, so you start off with this green honeycomb matrix. This is how objects are formed. They layer very thin layers of plastic to make this honeycomb shape. And you put one layer on top of another, on top of another, on top of another, on top of another. When you see what it is, call it out. One more layer. Another layer. Ooh, you guys are slow. Frog, more specific. Close, really close actually. Yoda. You got the Jim Henson thing going, so you were in the ballpark. Yes, this is a 3D printing of this car, uh, the character of Star Wars Yoda. And you can see by putting one layer of plastic on top of another, on top of another, you create an actual object, a real three-dimensional object. You go all the way up to the head, and then you seal off the top of the dome, right? This was created in a few minutes. If any of you wanted to learn enough about you know, sculpting or modeling, this probably would take you days, if not weeks, to design this well. 
but the 3D printer can take the blueprint from the computer and spit out this object very easily and very quickly. Okay? You can make some pretty cool stuff. So with this new technology of 3D printing, what do you think the first thing people want to do would be? Make Yodas? Make bobsleds? No, what do people want to make? Oh, but why would you judge? They're not illegal. They're illegal. That's the point of this presentation. Yes, guns. Not illegal guns. And I'll explain why they're not illegal in a couple minutes. Questions at the end. Okay. So we have here a 3D designed gun. Is this a problem? Has the government banned these? Can the government ban these? Are 3D guns legal? To answer my friend's prejudged question. <laughs> so let's talk about the Liberator. Okay, the Liberator is a model of a 3D gun created by this gentleman, Cody Wilson. Cody, until not too recently, was a law student at the other law school in Austin, which you may not think very highly of, but, but he, was, he was studying there. Uh, and in full disclosure, Cody is a, uh, uh, I'm a client, or he is my client. I, I am working and doing some consulting for him, so I put that out there. Uh, but Cody, while he was in law school, decided that, well, we have these 3D guns. I'm sorry, we have these 3D printers. We should be making guns with them. So he designed a number of products using his 3D printer. So one of the first things he made, and I'm in Texas, so you probably know what this is, an AR-15 lower. People know what this is? This is basically the guts of a semi-automatic rifle. Uh, these parts are not really regulated. Um, the upper part is what actually requires a lot of the licensing, but these are not particularly regulated. So Cody was able to build an AR-15 lower that was made entirely of plastic. And by fitting it into a semi-automatic rifle, he was able to make a working gun that was able to withstand hundreds of rounds of ammunition. Okay? And Cody decided to not stop just at the receivers. He said, let me make the magazine. The magazine is this thing right here. That's what you put bullets into, if you don't know how guns work. I mean, I give this talk across the country, and I always have to assume different levels of knowledge. When I give this in LA, I assume you know nothing. In Texas, I'll assume you know what a magazine is, but I will, I will perhaps not make that assumption. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't. Okay? He actually nicknamed this magazine the Cuomo in honor of the governor of New York, who uh, decided to ban these types of magazines. So it was a very, very fitting tribute. But he wasn't content to just build AR-15 lowers or magazines. Cody was destined to build an entire pistol, a working handgun, out of 3D printed parts. Enter the Liberator, aptly named to liberate us from the, you know, you fill in the blank. So this may not look like a gun, but if you look at each of these parts, when assembled properly, they form a fully functioning pistol. It's made entirely out of plastic, except for this little nail, that's what's called a firing pin, okay? In case you don't know how a bullet works, this is a bullet, right? And at the tip of the bullet, it's a little bit of gunpowder. And the way you make a gun go boom is you take something sharp and you pierce the back of the bullet. That's called the firing pin. Once you pierce the back of the bullet, it makes an explosion, sends out the projectile, and it flies away. So the only metal in this weapon are the bullet and the nail. Everything else is made entirely out of plastic. And here is an idea of what it looks like when you assemble it. And here's Cody holding the gun. Here's another shot of it. So um, initially, when Cody first designed this, uh, uh, when he was testing it, uh, he didn't pull the trigger himself because it was probably pretty dangerous to do this. So what he did was he attached a string to the trigger and slid like, you know, like 10 feet away and like yanked it. But after enough trials, he became confident that the plastic was strong enough to handle the combustion. And he started firing it himself. This was not an actual loaded weapon, though you should not be firing, aiming weapons indoors for anything. But Cody tried this out. So we have a question, right? Is this legal? Is what Cody did lawful? So the short answer is yes, but it gets a little bit more complicated than that. And I want to first explain a few things about 3D printed guns, okay? First of all, this is not how 3D printed guns work. You do not press print on your computer and out pops a fully functional metallic weapon 
on a piece of paper, right? That's not how 3D printed guns work. And the reason why I have to make this point clear is that a lot of people probably think, oh my God, this is how 3D printed guns work. I press, press a button and boom, a gun pops out, okay? This is not how these things work. Another point I want to make is that it's, contrary to what you may think, very easy to make a gun. Very easy. So who knows what a zip gun is? What's a zip gun? It's an improvised gun. This may surprise you, but I can take any of you down to Home Depot and for about five or 10 bucks, buy enough supplies to make a gun. Very easy. This is a zip gun. Okay, ready? This is a garden hose nozzle, a garden hose nozzle with a soldering gun. You know, maybe $10 of parts. By fashioning together and welding the nozzle onto a soldering gun, you just made a handgun. Congratulations. This is one of those little, you know, those little keychain flashlights. You see those around, right? Well, like someone hollowed out the middle of the flashlight and replaced it with the mechanics for a gun. You load the bullet in there, joop, jam it, you have a gun. Okay. I don't say this to scare people, but what I want to explain is there are a lot easier and cheaper ways of making a gun using 3D printing. So here is an experiment. Do not try this at home. Okay. If you look on YouTube, you'll find the video where I got this from. These idiots make it, I call them idiots for a reason. These idiots make a gun out of a piece of rubber tubing and a metal pipe. Maybe $3 of parts at a hardware store, right? How do they make a gun out of rubber tubing and a pipe? I know it's the recording on their cool cell phone camera, right? At the end of the pipe, there's a little dimple, okay? This functions as a firing pin. When you put this dimple against a shotgun cartridge, boom, and the projectile flies out. So what do these idiots do? Mind you, they're indoors, right? It gets worse. So they load the shotgun cartridge into this piece of rubber tubing, okay? Now, I want to point something out. So first, you'll see that the shotgun cartridge is in this rubber tubing, and he has the metal pipe, and he's about to jam it in, okay? I want to point out a few things, like where's Waldo, right? First of all, everyone see this box with these shotgun holes on them? They've done this before. So they've been shooting at this wall. I want to show you something else. See that electro outlet up there? They are firing a shotgun show, maybe two, maybe one foot from where there's electro outlets. These guys are morons, but I'm making this point for a reason, okay? So, okay, what happens? He, lo he lines it up. So it's a firing pin is lined up with a thing. You get to see the, the outlets with the extension cords running. There's like three extension cords, right? What do you think happens next when he jams it in? Boom. Okay? If you look closely, there's another hole that appears on the, uh, on the box because of where the shell hit. And they're firing at a distance of what, maybe a foot? Not smart. Okay? Somehow they survived. Okay? He takes out the metal pipe. He has a shotgun shell. It's smoking. Look how proud he is. Um, and you see that the shotgun shell was spent. Okay? Do not try this at home. These guys are idiots. But the point I'm trying to convey to you is that if some idiots want to make a dangerous weapon, they don't need a computer. They don't need a 3D printer. They need a piece of rubber tubing and a pipe, which maybe costs $3 at a hardware store. Okay? And oh, by the way, people won't even think twice if you have some rubber tubing and a pipe in your bag, right? You go to the airport, you know, whatever, some rubber tubing, pipe, small, whatever. But the more important question, not whether the, could they do it, was it legal? Were these gentlemen allowed to make an improvised zip gun in this matter? Contrary to what you may think, the answer is it was perfectly legal. So our favorite convenience store, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, right? What is their position on this? As may surprise you, their position is if you make your own gun, not for sale, but if you make your own gun, it's perfectly legal. There is no prohibition on making a, a gun in this fashion. There are some limits on making automatic weapons and other bigger types of arms. I'm not talking about that. A simple handgun or rifle, there's absolutely no prohibition from ATF or BAFT, as they're called now. They add explosive to their name because they're so, such explosive personalities, right? So then what's the problem, right? If you can make your own gun, 
why am I even here, right? Why am I even talking to you about this topic? Well, it gets a little bit more complicated. Because with 3D printed guns, they're not just uh, regulating the, the manufacturing of the gun. No. In fact, what's being regulated is the sharing of data about these guns. So remember at the outside I showed you that code, this is how you make a cylinder, this is how you make a sphere? This is code, this is information. And the way that regulating 3D printed guns work <coughs> is by telling people you can't share information about these guns. You can't put blueprints for these guns on the internet. This, I will argue, and you can agree or not, infringes not only on Second Amendment rights, but also First Amendment rights. So let's start at the very beginning, as we, as we perhaps should, with the First Amendment. Okay? And it's black letter law that the government cannot censor speech based on its content. They cannot engage in what's called a prior restraint to limit speech in virtually any way. There are very narrow exceptions if something's not protected. But you may say, wait a minute, Josh, we're not talking about, you know, political speech or, you know, you know, uh, you know, art or literature. We're talking about something dangerous like a gun, right? Can't the government, you know, censor speech that's dangerous? No. So I'm sure maybe you've heard of a book called The Anarchist Cookbook, right? Everyone, you know, she's, don't tell me why you're nodding your head so, so vigorously. I don't want to know. For, for the bar, I don't want to know. Okay. So The Anarchist Cookbook is a book that's been around for almost 50 years. And in its pages, you will find instructions on how to make dangerous stuff, right? How to make pipe bombs, how to make IEDs, how to make various poisons with chemicals you find in your kitchen cupboard. Basically, a little mischief handbook, right? How to take stuff that you can buy in the store and turn it into a weapon. Unsurprisingly, when this book came out, governments tried hard to ban the sale of this book. Right Before there was Amazon, you'd actually have to go to a bookstore to buy it. So they tried to prevent bookstores from even stocking this, this title. This may not come as a surprise to you, but those efforts failed. The courts held consistently the mere fact that speech may be dangerous doesn't mean you can punish it in advance. The mere fact that someone can take these blueprints and use it to, to, to inflict murder doesn't mean that you can uh, abandon the speech initially, <clears throat> right? The speech must pose an imminent threat, some sort of imminent incitement to, uh, in, in, uh, inciting of violence for it to be limited. Okay, so check that one off, right? The mere fact we're talking about dangerous guns, that, that doesn't mean that these speeches can be regulated. You may say, wait a minute, Josh. That's a book, right? Book is clearly speech. We're not talking about a book. We're talking about like information and code. What, why is the first amendment applying here? Well, my friends, information is speech. This is not a particularly revolutionary concept. For a number of years, the courts have recognized that the mere fact that you choose to express yourself on a computer does not deprive it of first amendment protections. We had a case a couple of years ago, Brown versus EMA. This involved violent video games, right? The mere fact that you create a violent video game, rather writing a violent short story, does not divest your first amendment rights. <clears throat> in fact, in 2011, in a case called Sorel v. IMS Health, the Supreme Court held very clearly the creation and dissemination of information are speech. The creation and dissemination of information are speech. Not just creating information, disseminating it, or as you like to say, share or retweet or whatever you want to say, right? Spreading information is speech. Why is this salient for our purposes? Because the way 3D printing makes sense is for people to create these blueprints and share them. I humbly submit that these are quintessential acts of speech that are protected by the First Amendment. And going forward, they'll start making a lot more sense. Like Neo in the Matrix, eventually we'll see that everything is data, everything is speech, and everywhere we look, there is data involved. So it makes a lot of sense for this to be provided First Amendment protections. Okay, so we got down the First Amendment, right? Let's talk about the Second Amendment, of course. A well-regulated militia being necessary to secure their free state, the right of people to keep in their arms shall not be infringed. Okay, what does this mean? Well, the first 200 years of the Republic didn't really mean too much, to the court at least, but in 2008, in the case of District of Columbia versus Heller, we have a holding from the court. The Second Amendment guarantees an individual right to keep and bear arms for self-defense. Right there in the Constitution, it says. 
This is Dick Heller. He was the, uh, the plaintiff in Heller. Two years later, we have a follow-up case called McDonald v. City of Chicago. This is Otis McDonald. This case extended the Second Amendment to the states, the process known as incorporation. Okay? This is actually a cool picture of Heller and McDonald uh, 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 together in one shot. So what does the Second Amendment have to do with this, right? Well, the Second Amendment said, uh, Heller said a few things. You have the right to a gun. What kind of gun? Heller didn't say, but it did say a handgun, which was a gun that Heller was trying to register, was the quintessential self-defense weapon. Okay? But Heller left a lot of loose ends. A lot of loose ends, right? And the court has been remiss. They have not granted a single Second Amendment case since McDonald. So I'm going to do a little bit of you know, interpretation of how I read Heller, and you can tell me if it makes sense or not. So I argue on the one hand that the Second Amendment includes a right to acquire arms. Okay? Why do I say that? Well, think about it. How do you exercise the right to keep your arms unless you can acquire one? Right? Guns don't materialize out of thin air. In order to have a meaningful Second Amendment right, you need to be able to get it from somewhere. This is not to say that there are no regulations possible in the sale of guns. I'm by no means am I suggesting that. Rather, the sale of guns can't be banned. Imagine a situation where the government says, you know what? You can keep whatever guns you have now. You just can't buy any new ones. Right? That would dry up Second Amendment very quickly. In fact, Heller, this is actually a true story, he had a gun from the 1970s. It was in his home. And then D.C. banned them. At all hours of the day, he had to keep the gun locked up. If he were to remove that lock even for a second, he would be a felon. Even if someone broke into his house and was about to kill him, there was no self-defense exception, which proves me again why Heller had to be correctly decided. What happened after the case? He was able to go register a gun and buy a new one. So even though Heller wasn't entirely clear about this, I think you can read that you have this right to acquire guns as part of your second amendment right. Okay. Even more strong than the right to acquire guns, I think you have to discuss the right to make guns. And this tradition, I think, is even stronger. Long before there were any gun stores, you had patriots, the, the, the founding fathers, bearing their muskets, bearing their rifles, and fighting a revolution. If you ever see the movie John Adams, a miniseries on HBO, there's an awesome scene where Abigail Adams is pouring these lead molten uh, musket balls, right? Uh, so I'd argue that we have a long-standing tradition in our country of allowing people to make their own arms for self-defense. And in fact, this is even reflected in current doctrine. Under the ATF's rules, those idiots in the garage can make their own gun, and that's still perfectly lawful. So I humbly submit that the Second Amendment includes not only a right to acquire arms, but a right to make arms. But wait, you're not done yet with Kamala, right? So you have the First Amendment, right? I mean, the Second Amendment. But we got them both. What do I mean by a hybrid First Amendment? Okay. Think about what a ban on 3D guns is actually doing. It's telling you to stop talking about a constitutional right. Oh. Not only are they censoring speech, but they're censoring speech about it right in the Constitution. That would be like telling people, oh, yeah, you can't talk about your faith. You can't wish people Merry Christmas. Well, is that a free speech violation or a free exercise violation? I'd say it's both. Right? By limiting speech about the Second Amendment, the scrutiny becomes even stronger, right? Because we need people to converse and discuss their own constitutional rights and their own civil liberties. Okay? So this is the constitutional framework that we have so far. Next, I want to talk about efforts by Congress to regulate 3D printed guns. And the first attempt is something called the Undetectable Firearms Act. Okay? This law was passed in 1988. And in short, the law says every gun must have some quantity of metal sufficient to trigger a metal detector. Okay? Now, there were no 3D printed guns in 1988. Where did this law come from? Well, it's due to the Glock handguns. Everyone know what a Glock handgun is? Okay. It, it's, a, it's a very popular handgun that came on the scene in the 80s. But the real fault is not Glock. But Bruce Willis in Die Hard, John McClane, right? So there's this great scene in a Die Hard movie, and I do not have nearly enough swag to pull this off, but I will try my best, where Bruce Willis delivers this line as only he can. And he says, luggage? 
That punk pulled a Glock 7 on me. Know what that is? It's a porcelain gun made in Germany. It doesn't show up on your airport x-ray machines here, and it costs more than what you make in a month. Okay? Every single word in this sentence is false. <laughs> Every one. There is no Glock 7. No such gun exists, right? It's not made of porcelain. It's made of metal. It's not made in Germany. It's made in Austria. It will show up on an x-ray machine, and it costs about $400, right? Everything he said was false. Every single word. Like, I can't imagine even more wrong stuff being said. <laughs> But this freaked out Congress, and because Congress gets freaked out to see a movie, he's like, oh my god, we have to stop this, right? You know, this is a reality check for members of Congress to give you an indication of where we are as a society. So in other words, they passed this Undetectable Firearms Act, which really applied to nothing, right? Because there were, there were no, por what's this, like a teacup, a porcelain gun? I don't know what that would even be like, right? But anyway. <laughs> but they passed this law, and we have it in the book. So as it stands now, if you make a 3D printed gun with no metal, it would actually be in violation of this law. That's why code includes that firing pin in the bullet. Um, this isn't nearly as big of a deal as you think. What is ammunition made out of? Metal. Is a gun without ammo very good? No. So it's kind of, you know, sure, you can't have plastic guns. I guess you can throw a bullet at someone, you know. I, I, I don't even know. Uh, but, but rubber bullets don't go very far. They're not very lethal. Um, so we're talking about, you know, a marginal safety measure. Whatever. It's not a big deal. This is... It, it, it accepts plastic guns so long as they have a little piece of metal in it, which is fine. Yet, when the outset of 3D guns hit, we had this rush. Senator Chuck Schumer from New York said, we have to ban these guns. We have to stop these plastic guns. Well, will someone please think of the children or whatever, whatever people say, right? But how do we stop 3D printed guns? Well, you really can't. And this is something which they realize very, very clearly. Why? If any of you ever downloaded something, or if any of you put a picture on the internet, right, you can't take it back, right? Ask Kardashian, whatever. You can't undownload stuff. Once this information is on the web, gone. So what are some of the strategies people suggested to prohibit 3D guns? Well, one, one professor said, let's ban the materials, right? Let's make it so people can't buy the plastic material used to make a 3D gun. This is a terrible idea for one very good reason. You can make it out of metal. This is a 3D gun made out of steel. I visited the, the, uh, the, the solid concept lab in Austin, and this guy was able to engineer in 1911, a very popular handgun, entirely out of steel. So even if you ban the plastic, you can still make these things, right? You can't stop it. Someone else said, oh, let's ban gunpowder. Okay, well, uh, 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 reality check, right? So there was a Supreme Court case a number of years ago where a city tried to impose a tax on newspaper ink. Okay, they were trying to punish the newspaper, and the Supreme Court said, nah, -uh -uh. you can't do that. You can't regulate the means by which people exercise constitutional rights. Ditto here, you can't ban gunpowder, not gonna fly. Okay, what about IP, intellectual property, right? This is a possibility. So, at the outset, I'll note that the, the gun that Cody uploaded, right, the Liberator, and he also published another model, were all open source. There were no patent infringements. Had there been a patent infringement, like if I put on, you know, uh, the patent for the Glock 19 porcelain gun, whatever stupid thing, right, I would be in trouble with the Glock company. They would sue me. But an open source gun doesn't have that problem. What about DRM? If remember this digital rights management. If you have one of the older iPods and you try to put on a song that you illegally downloaded or bought somewhere else, it may not work. Okay, why? Because the recording industry said we need to use this technology, DRM, in order to stop illegal music, right? So in other words, when you buy a song from the Amazon store or the iTunes store, this may come as a surprise to you. You don't actually own the song. You only have a license to use it so long as they permit. Same for Amazon Kindle, right? I use Kindle all the time, but I don't actually own the book. Whenever I download a book from Kindle, it's a license user temporarily. So this actually happened, true story. Safety purchased the book 1984 from Amazon. Anyone know about this one? The book 1984, of course, George Orwell's Orwellian classic, he invented the word. There was a dispute between Amazon and the publisher of that book. So what did Amazon do? They remotely deleted the book from your Kindle. Talk about creepy. <laughs> Amazon remotely deleted 1984 from your Kindle device. 
you can't make this up, right? The, the, the irony alert never went off in their lawyers' heads, like, wait a minute, maybe this is a bad book to do. Anyway, but publishers say, we have control over these books, and if Amazon no longer has a license to offer it, then we yank the book from your device. Wait, how can Amazon tell us what to read? Well, the device is Amazon's device too. They can control the means by which you read. So what about 3D printing, right? Who is opposed to 3D printing? Manufacturers. Why are manufacturers opposed to 3D printing? Because you can print stuff without having to buy it from them. So to give you a really easy example, imagine that I could download the, the newest LeBron James sneakers, right? $300 sneakers, I can print them in five minutes. Don't have to wait online, don't have to pay anything for it. Nike goes out of business very quickly, right? The only reason these companies can exist is they can sell very cheap products at very high margins. That's why these companies exist. They're not custom, they're the same size for everyone, or even better, maybe I can, I can measure my foot and print a pair of LeBrons that fit my foot exactly, you know, like what athletes get. How are the manufacturers going to stop this, right? The same way that the recording industry was basically, you know, decimated by Napster and file sharing, and now the movie industry is also being decimated by, by you know, Netflix and various other services, you don't always need to buy stuff from the original source. So here we get into some sort of regulatory game theory, if you will. Does anyone know what the Baptist and bootlegger theory is? Don't ever hear about this? Don't know what this is? No? Okay. So I'll explain it like this. During prohibition, all right, who favored banning alcohol? Well, we had two groups. You had the Baptists who said that alcohol was sinful and we need to get rid of it. Who was right there behind them supporting prohibition? The bootleggers, right? Why do the bootleggers want to ban alcohol? Because once the product is off the market, they can charge higher monopoly rents. They can charge more for their moonshine, okay? This is not just during prohibition. They don't live in a dry county. Uh, on the border of your county, is there a liquor store? Who runs that liquor store? Someone else, right? Who do you think keeps your county dry? The owner of that liquor store. Because once you cross the county line, there's a liquor store right there, that liquor store will pay as much money as needed to keep the prohibition in place. Because once that prohibition is lifted, the market price is settled and he loses his monopoly to sell moonshine to who's ever buying in your county. Okay? So imagine a similar situation with the Baptists and bootleggers for guns, right? Who are the Baptists? Well, you have your gun, uh, gun control activists, right? People say we need to have safety, we need to get rid of these dangerous guns. But who are the bootleggers actually funding this? The manufacturers. They want a way to stop people from 3D printing. This poses an existential threat to their existence. Because once people start printing LeBron James sneakers, they don't care about guns. Nike goes out of business, right? They lose their entire business model of charging $300 for a pair of sneakers that cost $20 manufacture. So imagine if this Baptist and bootlegger coalition succeeds and they're able to get companies that build 3D printers to install filter. And the same way if on an old computer you couldn't play you know, an illegal song in your iPod, what if you try and print something that looks like a gun on your 3D printer? Error, right? This is what would keep the manufacturers alive by censoring in advance and creating lists of things not to print. Or even worse, when you try to print something, it checks with some sort of government database if you have a license to print it. You can see already how this would basically save the manufacturers, but severely infringe on ex uh, uh, expression and creativity, both for guns and anything else. What if we're making a toy gun? Not even a real gun, but it resembles a gun. Eh, can't build it. This constitutes a prior restraint, and you're censoring speech based on not a very good rationale. The final method I want to talk about, something which you've probably never been exposed to, but involves export control laws. Okay, what are export control laws? Something called ITAR, the International Traffic and Arms Regulation. And the, perfect of, uh, the purpose of ITAR, and there's a very thick book that guides it, is to keep dangerous stuff from going to our enemies. So, really easy example. The Sony PlayStation 4 is a very powerful supercomputer, very powerful. 
You may not know this, but if you want to send Sony PlayStation 4s overseas, you need to get permission from the government. Better example, if you want to send a missile overseas, you need to get permission from the government, right? This was called a munition. This is something that's dangerous that we do not want our folks overseas. There's actually a funny story. There was a, um, a guy in, in, in Houston who had some sort of a plumbing uh, company, and he sold his truck to CarMax or something, right? You see this? Where did the truck wind up? In ISIS, right? So basically, there's a shot of ISIS riding around with the ISIS flag. You see on the side, Houston plumbing. So who the hell knows how his car made it from Houston to, 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 to you know, Damascus, wherever they were. But um, <laughs> we have this rule. But the government's interpreted ISIS in a very curious manner. They've used the word munitions to refer not just to things like blow up or supercomputers, but to information. And the government's actually taken the position, which I think is, is unconstitutional, that before you want to ship information overseas, you need their permission. So what about cryptography, right? Cryptography is basically using uh, computers to secure data and make it private. What happens if you want to ship a book to England for printing? You need the government's permission to engage in the act of speech. A book. We're not talking about, you know, a bomb. This is no different than the anarchist cookbook, right? You're shipping information overseas, sharing with people. Even worse, what happens if this book has a CD-ROM in the back? Remember those little round coaster things, right? What if the book had a CD-ROM in the back with source code? The government says, no, you can't ship the CD-ROM. This constitutes a limitation of information expression that I don't think is justified by the First Amendment. Without any showing that this is actually super dangerous, right? This is not a nuclear bomb. This is a book on cryptography. The government has taken the position, we can tell you not to ship it. This brings us back to my friend uh, and client, Cody Wilson. On May 8th, 2013, just about two years ago, the State Department sent a letter. They weren't busy with other, <laughs> fortunately they had the right email address, you know, only one device, you know. So the State Department sent an email to, uh, uh, to Cody Wilson. And they said, hey Cody, we see that you posted online all these blueprints for a, uh, you know, the Liberator pistol, right, and these other, and these other parts. Guess what? Those are munitions, not the actual gun. Descriptions of the guns. And oh, by the way, that data information should be removed immediately. This is a prior restraint of speech. They're telling you to take down information because they think it's dangerous. Even though there are decades of cases saying that you cannot do this. Uh, I would humbly submit that under the Constitution, this is void and uh, not justifiable, okay? So I'm gonna stop here and I welcome your questions, but I, I, I am really eager to he hear what you have to say, so thank you very much. <laughs> All right, who's up first? Yeah. Uh, they still haven't approved it. So I've improved it. Yep, still in limbo, which is which is now almost two years later. It's been crazy. So that's in the last category. Uh, I can't get into it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, but yes, he, he he complied. He took the files down, but more than that, he he took the files down. Okay, what else? Yeah. Well, if you go anywhere in BitTorrent, you can find the files Cody uploaded. You can find them anywhere. They are not difficult to identify, okay? Practically speaking, once a file goes to the internet, you can never retract it. It's impossible. So what is the government trying to do here? They're grasping at straws, and they're trying to discourage people from engaging in this activity. But they're doing so in a way that constitutes a prior restraint, which, is, which I think is, is void. Um, so the government knows that they're in trouble here, right? They, they can't actually win this, so they're trying to just make a big fuss and scare people about it. But they, they can't actually stop the spread of information. They know that very well. Yes? How many times will it shoot before it melts? 
So the Liberator, uh, I think, was tested with a couple hundred rounds, one after another. It, it's very it, uh, the, the Air 15 lower handled hundreds of rounds, right? So this, this plastic is pretty solid. Um, I mean, if you want to buy an AR-15 lower, you can buy it much cheaper than this. This is a, this is a very expensive uh, piece of equipment, but these are very durable pieces. Yes? Well, so the question is, you know, what would a reasonable regulation of this technology look like? Okay, as the law stands now, idiots can make guns in the garage, right? So you would need a massive change of the law to ban idiots making guns. But even more so, what would actually uh, stop people from making these sorts of guns? Well, one option is to ban the sharing of the information, right? But those sorts of filters have what's called overbreath problems because you're, you're eliminating too much speech. Well, what if you ban the materials? Well, at that point, you're also infringing on people's right to create. In other words, I don't know and I haven't seen what the correct way of stopping this in advance. I, I, I tend to submit that the only way of doing this is to punish people for actually possessing guns that don't have metal in them. I think that's probably the only way of stopping it. I don't think you can constitutionally stop this at the forefront. You can only stop it at the after point once these guns are made. Yes, sir. We understand this is your argument is they're using the fear of guns to stop the spread of the technology that makes them because that technology can be used to make you know, something else. And once it's no longer cost prohibitive, anybody in here can have a 3D printer and pick a shoe or a computer. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if this will happen, but I suspect that there are people in the recording industry that, that want to impose regulation of 3D printing that would gladly jump behind the 3D gun bandwagon, and they will ride that bandwagon all the way. Uh, you know, with, with the next decade or so, maybe 15 years. I mean, you can go now to any Staples or Kinko's, right, and, or, and they'll have a 3D printer there that you can rent for you know, an hour and print whatever you want. This is going to become much more uh, useful. And what's interesting is today people have a lot of desire to customize stuff. So I've been about SodaStream, right? People love making their own stuff now. And with 3D printing, you can actually customize something for your needs, right? Say that you have a disability and that the regular gun you buy in the store doesn't fit your hand. You can actually now custom design a gun to fit your disability. There's actually significant potential for this technology for people who can't buy something off the shelf that fits their needs. Yes, sir. I was just going to say, yeah, they're a few, they're, you know, a thousand bucks barely. Yeah, yeah, appreciate it. Yes, sir. You were talking about earlier about how 3D printers can print metal. Can they print bullets now? Uh, I mean, yeah, you, you can't print gunpowder, but the actual casing you could print. Not a very good way of making bullets, although now there's a short demand, maybe you should. But it's not a very effective way of actually printing uh, bullets. I know you have class of 1250, so I'll stop soon. Any other questions? Going once, going twice, sold. Thank you all so much. Appreciate it very much. Thank you.